Hello there. On behalf of Dublin Pride, I'd like to wish you all a very warm welcome to Pride at Work 2021. We're delighted to have eight modules over the next two days with a whopping 26 different speakers taking part. With plenty of opportunities to network between the sessions and visit our many wonderful community organizations via our expo feature, which will be our community hub, community center. I'm not really one for long speeches, so we'll kick off right away with any, uh, uh, sorry, Erin from Tenny, Transgender Equality Network of Ireland, who will be joined by a few guests where they'll be exploring the topic of LGBT staff networks being put to the test and how they can keep people informed and connected. So without further ado, take it away, Erin. Thanks, Jamie. So today we are here for the first Pride module, which is really looking at LGBTQ plus staff networks and how they've been put to the test. So we know before COVID, the, wor the world was full of employers investing heavily in staff networks and social activities that kept the office and office tied together. Um, and now following that, what are LGBTQ plus staff networks doing to keep people connected in COVID and beyond? And where are they going forward? Um, so I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation and am joined by a great panel, and I'm going to throw it to each of them to give a brief introduction of who they are, what they do, and then we'll start asking some questions. So we'll start with Martina. Hi, good morning, uh, everybody, and thanks very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I, I think most people know that I, I'm Martina, Martina Manone from Dublin City Council. Uh, I'm part of Dublin City Council's LGBTQ uh, staff network. Uh, I'm the chairperson of it, and that we have a very, very vibrant and wonderful uh, LGBTQ network within Dublin City Council. It's been there for the last seven years, um, and it's been there as a support and a resource not only for LGBTQ people but for the organisation as a whole. Um, I've been employed in Dublin City Council since 1997. I've worked in various departments. Uh, within the organization and I currently work in HR. Um, I know that Erin, um, you'll want to ask questions and I'm going to leave it. That's just my uh, brief introduction to me. I know some people know who I am um, and I love being part. I love being a lesbian. I love being part of uh, LGB, the LGBTQ family. It's the pride and soul of my, of my life. Um, and so I always love being part of particularly Dublin Pride being part of a network within my organization. I'm a proud public servant. I like the public service. I love being part of the public service. And I love being part of the public service as a great big gay. So that's me. And whenever you want to ask me questions, I know I'm looking forward to hearing from the other speakers also. Um, and I look forward to sharing our experiences with you. Awesome. Thanks, thanks. Aaron. I'll throw it. Thanks. I'll throw it to Francis to talk next. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, yeah, Francis Call is my name. Um, in my day job, uh, I, I work with the life insurance of the Bank of Ireland Group, which is New Ireland Assurance. Um, but last year, I took up as co-chair of the Bank of Ireland Group's um, LGBT plus um, employee network, which is called With Pride. And I have a fantastic co-chair in Kirsty Mulholland, uh, based out of Belfast. Um, it's carrying on the, the torch uh, from predecessors who did some fantastic work setting up uh, the network back in 2017. Um, and we do uh, a lot of work, um, you know, with a fantastic committee and hope to give you some flavor of that uh, on the uh, discussion today. Thanks, Aaron. Awesome, thanks. And then lastly, I'll throw it to Tony. Hi, Aaron. Hi guys, great to be with such uh, in, in such really good company. I'm dialing in from um, Antalya in Turkey. It's just after lunchtime here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm an independent curator of the Irish Career Archive, which was transferred to state ownership in the National Library of Ireland in 2008. I'm the founding editor of GCN. Uh, I cut my teeth as a journalist in the mid 80s on Out Magazine, which was Ireland's first attempt at 
a commercial lesbian gay uh, magazine and that folded after four years because of the very hostile social and economic climate at the time and that sort of fed into a demand for for myself and others some of my peers at the time for a a, a platform a media platform such as um, GCN became over over its uh, 33 years and um, throughout the 1980s that would have been I believe in my 20s, um, I was very involved in the administration of the Hirschva Centre, Dublin LGBT Community Centre in Temple Bar, um, and also had the honour of being uh, one time chair of the National LGBT Federation, we call it NXF for short. Um, and there was a period in the 1980s when, along with um, proposals for, for decriminalisation, we concerned ourselves, activists, we concerned ourselves with um, workplace practices, anti-discrimination legislation, equality legislation uh, and employment protocols. <clears throat> um, and they were very much part of, I'll, I'll come back to this later on, but they were very much part of a wider agenda of reform. Unfortunately, we had to wait it out until after the decriminalisation to see many of those uh, reforms uh, and new pieces of legislation enacted. Um, nothing was ever going to happen, very little was ever going to happen before um, decriminalisation in 1993. But I'm delighted to be part of this conversation, it's really important. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Tony. And I think we're actually going to start with you to kind of set the table for the panel discussion today. So kind of the first question to really get us going is over the last decade, we've seen a huge growth in the amount of organizations establishing LGBT plus staff networks. As someone who's been recording the history of the LGBT plus rights movement in Ireland for decades, from small student groups to establishing community centers, where do they fit or where do you see them fitting in the history of the LGBT plus rights movement? Okay, I think there's a, we can draw a very direct line over the last <laughs> almost 50 years now, a very direct line um, uh, between the LGBT staff networks that we see proliferating around Ireland right now and the very earliest um, um, community groups that were established in Queen's University Belfast and Trinity College Dublin. Two, the two earliest LGBT uh, campaigning uh, organising groups on the island of Ireland were interesting enough founded under the aegis and support of progressive student unions which tells you something about how necessary it is to create what um, some people often refer to as safe spaces, peer mediated spaces places where people can actually have conversations and I think that's what we see playing out now um, in terms of um, LGBT staff networks. It's a place, I, I mean they fill many many roles and um, first of all there's a primary social function as well um, and I think that's particularly important, <coughs> excuse me, that's particularly important um, when people um, might be reluctant, for example, are not, not interested in actually socialising around places where alcohol is sold. Um, again, another function um, and uh, benefit of outhouse, for example. But, but these staff networks um, fulfil a primary social role, uh, an information sharing role, uh, and then a, an advocacy role. <clears throat> and I don't think um, those aspects have changed that uh, that much since those earliest groups back in 1974, 1975, 1979, when, when a nascent LGBT civil rights movement uh, began to actually be, become uh, vocal uh, and visible. That's really great insight. Um, and thinking through that, like either Francis or Martina, how have you kind of seen LGBTQ plus staff networks kind of play into the history of advocacy for LGBTQ plus people? Um, in in terms of it, just in in relation to what Tony mentioned there, and those original uh, community groups, or going back to the seventies, certainly in Trinity and Queens, I mean it's uh, extraordinary to think just how brave those our our predecessors in some ways were, uh, given the the very very hostile um, atmosphere in Ireland in the seventies and particularly in the eighties for LGBT people. Um, I, so I think they have they lay, laid a very strong foundation for us. 
Uh, and that obviously has to continue into the workplace. Uh, if, if we're becoming more and more equal and becoming more acceptable in, in society generally, I think particularly in the, in relation to, uh, the public and civil service. Um, if like, I'll put it in context in Dublin City Council for you, seven years ago when we set up, uh, the, uh, LGBT network in Dublin City Council, we did so, we did so to promote uh, our own, our own visibility and to provide a confidential support and resource for, uh, not only LGBT people, but for the organization generally. Uh, but the real reason we did it was because, uh, in a, as one, as the largest local authority in the country employing 6,000 people, seven years ago, you would think there wasn't a gay in the place. And when we spend most of our working day, well, especially when pre-COVID, with our colleagues and probably spend more more time with them than we do with our loved ones at home, uh, to have to to not be comfortable being out or being yourself in work has a negative impact on you, whether you think it or believe it or not or see it. Um, and that is the reason, was one of the real reasons that we, we set up the network, apart from being a confidential support to one another. It was to be a support and resource to the organisation, but it was also to promote our own equality and inclusion and to drive that for ourselves. I think you know that unless LGBT people uh, make ourselves known and heard as, a, as human beings, as people, real people, uh, and as equals, uh, unless we do that ourselves, it, it it just isn't going to happen. And that so that is really what we've been doing for the last seven years is driving ourselves uh, with our own needs, with our own agendas and to promote our own visibility and to be seen as equals within the organisation. Um, and I think we've grown uh, hugely in, in where we started off in 2013 when we had just 10 people, 10 people on Pride uh, that year. Um, and to put that in context for you, uh, Dublin City Council has always been the main supporter and funder of Dublin Pride and up until, and has done so consistently every year since 1992. Uh, and up until uh, 2013, not one member of Dublin City Council walked in Pride or participated in the annual Pride event as Dublin City Council staff. They're all right in other, in other capacities. Um, and I suppose I know what you mentioned when I was talking to Jed on Friday and to yourself, Erin, um, Ireland didn't decriminalize homosexuality until 1993. Uh, so gay men were effectively criminals up until 1993. We had no equality legislation. Equality legislation, workplace legislation wasn't enacted until 1999. So you can understand that civil and public servants couldn't come out or be comfortable being out in work when you're coming from that kind of hostility and that kind of background. And certainly uh, Dublin City Council's LGBT network has really been pushing back those boundaries within our own organisation. And it has provided a huge safe space for us as LGBT people to meet. And it has given a very um, a positive and worthwhile message to everybody else, to the wider organisation that we're here, yes, we're queer, whether you like it or not. Uh, and we uh, expect to be treated as equals and we want the support of our organisation and our managers for that. And um, now, you know, these things won't happen unless there's buy in from the top. We happen to be very lucky with the chief executive we have. He's very supportive and very progressive. Uh, we have broad support from our senior management. Um, and uh, so, like, it's good. Uh, generally speaking, we are pushing out the boundaries. It hasn't always been easy and we can get to some of the challenges later. Um, but that's where we're at and that's where we're going, you know. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer or put it in context for you. Erin, Absolutely. But, and I think uh, putting that in context, we see that I think a lot of the work that these LGBTQ plus staff networks are doing is just exemplifying the bravery and the resilience of our community that amidst these odds and amidst these cultural stereotypes, that they are still willing to come together um, and build that support and to go forward. But thinking more about developing them um, in the workplace, I'm gonna throw a question to Francis. Um, we know that there's a social element to any staff network or group. A big part then of the function is about colleagues supporting colleagues. But a lot of these networks are set up within organizations that might have a lot of resources like banks. Um, so one of the questions I think that would be great if you could start us off on is how have you seen these groups use this support use this support to then support the wider community and include those who are less privileged? Yeah, thanks, Erin. Uh, look, I think it's a great question. And I think it comes back to kind of that 
purpose and ambition you set yourself like i i think all you know sort of networks like this start off uh, as tony said in kind of that safe space a community space but quickly you get onto well, what's your purpose what do you want to achieve um and i think impacting you know the communities uh you know that 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 uh you know organizations impact i think is a really important part of what we do um you know in, in the bank we deliberately i suppose aligned what we do in the network uh to the bank's overall purpose um you know and the purpose is about enabling customers colleagues and communities to thrive uh, you know so helping lgbt plus communities was an explicit part of that and i think it was really important to align what we do in the network to the organization's overall purpose so it's not just something that's been done on the side it's actually a center central part of what the organization is about and i think if you're not part of that central purpose it's easy to be forgotten or deprioritized uh you know so so we explicitly set out each year you know how we will impact uh the community um you know and we were clear from early on the best way of doing that was to engage with organizations who already do this very well like uh like dublin pride uh for example um but also pride organizations around the country belong to tenny and so on um you know and that could be done in different ways uh like there are obvious means like sponsorship you know but you get into things like you know training um or actually using company resources in a way that's that's beneficial uh you know we hosted an event uh with dublin pride and age action last year which you know was for senior members of the lgbt plus community and you know and that was great and that was kind of using the assets of an organization you know whether it's people property and so on in a way that that works and has that that impact um you know i think also having you know an lgbt plus employee network and the visibility of that kind of has that halo effect you know it has impact beyond what the network is actually doing and that i think that's a a sign of you know things that are maturing um you know for example certainly in the bank there would have been uh support for you know uh, through the bank's main community funding programs uh you know the sponsorship of the emerald warriors rugby club, club financial support for other organizations around around the, uh, around the country and i think the impact and visibility of a staff lgbt plus network fosters that recognition of of lgbt plus community organizations you know as something the company or organization you're in sees as important to support and that it's a good thing and that you're not having to sort of come from the side to say oh did you did you hear about this so um i think the last point for me is kind of you grow the staff network then and it gets amplified through i suppose the wider networks uh so there are you know professional networks like fusion which covers financial services outlaw which is the legal profession and i think they amplify the effort of company staff networks and again that's you know i i think that just grows it um and i think that engagement with community organizations on the ground and a dialogue like how can we help each other um is is really the best way because you know there are common goals in mind around that so um yeah, that's just uh, my thoughts on that one, Aaron. Yeah, thanks. Aaron, and I think you Aaron. highlighted. Go for it, Tony. Yeah, I was actually about to just throw it to you. No, sorry, um, sorry. I'll give you the floor. I I, I was going to um, just uh, offer offer a comment um, about something that Martina said. This uh, this idea of staff networks um, challenging negative stereotypes, and and you know it's. Some of us are old enough to remember a time when one could be re refused services and refused goods mm. as a consumer. Um, um, and Francis will actually, uh, this would pique uh, Francis's uh, curiosity, but during the height of the AIDS pandemic, insurance companies in Ireland refused to insure um, um, any LGBT people um, for life insurance um, if they were at, at all, regardless of, of their health status, because they simply be associated HIV as a very yeah. 
whatever. But there was a time when we could actually be, before the anti-discrimination legislation that Martina referenced, we could actually be kicked out of a, um, a bar or a hotel and refused accommodation, refused service. And there was absolutely nothing we could do about it. So we weren't valued as a consumer for a start. Now, if we have staff networks within these businesses um, challenging our stereotypes, it, just, it, it has, as Francis says, this halo effect in terms of actually validating our existence. And the other thing too is, you know, I'm always mindful of um, the mantra of uh, the feminist movement, the personal is political. And I, no better, no better um, illustration can you get of, of that, of uh, the, the best illustration you can get of that is, is people simply, ordinary people going about their lives. Ordinary people going about their lives without excuse, without apology. Uh, there was a very telling moment uh, during the Pride Parade two years ago. Three years ago, I think was her first appearance, when the LGBT staff network of the Defence Forces uh, appeared for the oh. first time with the Army Band. Now, and I, I remember having a conversation with um, Mark Mellis, the Chief of Staff of the Irish Defence Forces, and we ended up talking about things like um, eroding toxic masculinity. Now, here's the, the head of the Irish Defence Forces, and I was just um, saluting him, pardon the pun, um, for, first of all, coming out and supporting the staff network and bringing the army band as well uh, to lead Dublin Pride Parade uh, through the streets, and remarking on just the distance we come, you know, when there was, there was a time, and, and Aaron, you'd be familiar with it in the States, where you could actually simply be refused service or kicked out of the defence forces if you were uh, known to be LGBT. You just have to think back to Clinton's years, the um, to, uh, don't ask, don't tell. Um, uh, but um, the fact that the, um, you've got something like this, the LGBT staff network in the army challenging uh, putting to bed any last remaining uh, vestiges of what people call toxic masculinity. I think they were already challenged years ago by the advent of women uh, serving in the army. But it was quite remarkable. And the symbolism, the symbolism is enormous, I think, when you have a group like that at the centre of change in these organisations, whether it's a statutory body or a retail body. Mm. That's a really good insight, Tony. And the question that I think it, it brings up for me, and I'm going to do the the host faux pas of throwing this out to everyone, but how have you seen kind of these LGBT staff networks impact these corporations that in a society, there were these, these rights to refuse service or a right to deny work um, and making it illegal to be gay? How have they kind of helped corporate corporations reconcile that? And how have they maybe held them accountable to then impact wider society to make it to the point where some people can go about their lives and it's not the main focus within work or, or life. Um, yeah. Do you want, uh, will I come in there? Um, go for it, Martin, I think yeah. in relation, okay. I think in relation to ourselves, uh, like we're a, a public sector body and we we're there to serve the citizens of, of Dublin, obviously. Um, in terms of having an impact on how how we deal, well, firstly, initially from, from my own point of view and from our network's point of view, it's how we deal with our staff and our colleagues who are LGBT. Um, uh, and I think that has had a wider impact. If, if we see ourselves reflected back to ourselves in just our everyday and that, it, yes, it's okay to have be at Pride and to be there as a, as a, as a, as a local authority employee, um, it ha we're normalizing ourselves and we're normali normalizing ourselves for our, for the wider corporate body. That has had a big impact on, on everybody. Like just the example I gave you there earlier, when we walked uh, in Pride in 2013 as Dublin City Council staff, uh, there was about 10 of us. In 2019, there was up to 200 of us. That's a big deal. That is a big deal to have gone from uh, 10 to nothing up to 2013, uh, to about 10 of us in 2013 and in 2019 to over 200 people and more wanting to be part of that. Uh, now, if we're going to be seen as equals, then we have to be treated as equals and there has to be buy-in from the top to achieve that. The knock-on effect for us is we are just now more and more uh, acceptable. Uh, it's acceptable to be LGBT somewhat. We're not fully there. We're not fully where we should be, but we're getting there. Um, and it, part of that for me is, um, is our, the LGBT network in Dublin City Council is becoming more and more, uh, a go-to, uh, group 
for the wider corporate body. In other words, somebody in, who is on our network committee and is in housing, is, the, their colleagues in housing can go directly to them if they have queries about trans people, for, ex, for example, who may be homeless or who need, who are, who were, who had a lease in a Dublin City Council accommodation, were formerly in as a male and have now transitioned, have their gender recognition cert and all that. They come to us now as the body for guidance and advice on that. That's a good thing. That's the way it should be. Um, and I, I, and what I would like to see happening for us more and more is that we become more formally the go-to body for equality and inclusion and diversity for LGBT people within the organisation. I think um, we have, uh, I think our chief executive definitely understands that. We have um, a head of HR, I think, that understands that. Um, and uh, the way to, to approach it, I think, and I hope that it's seen this way, is that we're there as a support and that we're better working together. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be rows. It doesn't mean that we aren't going to threaten people or, you know, that we cross, we'll have differences of opinion from time to time. If we do, so what? We just have differences of opinion, move on. Uh, but So I think it's helped from that point of view, and certainly from Dublin City Council's point of view, we have had a huge input into setting up, <clears throat> uh, helping set up uh, other civil service uh, LGBT networks. We've done so in the Department of Transport, uh, Children and Youth Affairs, Justice and Equality, uh, and other bodies. And we've also helped uh, and given guidance and advice on how to set up a network with, uh, with South Dublin, and we have worked very well with them. We had the benefits of we had a conference there last September, last October, on out in work that we did uh, co-hosted with our colleagues in South Dublin. So it's broadening it out. It's being supportive, as Francis has said, and it's normalising us for our colleagues. You know, and I think that's important that they see us as as uh, people just like them, just wired slightly mm -hmm. differently in some ways. You know? Yeah. So essentially, yeah, what we're seeing sure. with the, go for it, Francis. Yeah. Yeah, just quickly to follow up on that, because, I, you know, I, I think to to Tony's point, um, I think it's clear that that corporates do lag social change, you know, um, but when they get up to speed, I think it can be powerful. Um, I think, uh, you know, storytelling is a huge part of that, you know, and not to be afraid to tell those stories, such as the examples I think Tony has given. Um, I think you get this confluence of society moving, you know, stakeholders for organizations saying, well, what are we doing on this and so on? And then you have from within the staff networks and structure and hopefully that that support from the top down that that allows a forum to actually raise issues such as the examples I think you've given, Tony, like you kind of say, you, you hope that couldn't happen in that forum today, but versions of it could. And you're kind of going that there'll be people inside and stakeholders who would actually say, like, that's that's not OK and recognize it for what it is as flat and out discrimination. And, you know, I, I think the more you have within and without, uh, the more you can make that change. Um, and, you know, I think the work that the networks do at the moment is about looking around to see, well, what are the, the challenges of today? They mightn't be as as obvious uh, as that, you know, but, you know, things like, for example, we've done certainly in the bank, you know, that we recognize specific challenges for the transgender community, you know, just going about their daily business, opening an account and all the sort of hassle and challenges of, you know, um, pronouns and everything else. And so we put in place, you know, a transgender training pack for all, the branch network and it's just a sort of education because people are usually not you know intentionally uh you know trying to cause trouble but they just don't know and you know i think it's trying to look at those areas where we can support educate and um, but equally if you get an issue you have the right people in the right place to to, to make that change and, and you build that momentum Francis, can I just uh, follow up on your observations by also, rem I suppose, reminding ourselves, taking a moment to remind ourselves that uh, as liberated as we imagine we are, that there are still people who are 
coming along the route. They're part of that process and haven't quite arrived there yet. And I'm thinking, for example, of somebody who arrives, in a, who's LGBT, arrives in, or any part of any minority grouping, arrives in a workplace, it's all very new, it can be a little bit intimidating, um, and they're still just grappling with just people in their own there are people like that. In, in spite of the extraordinary political, cultural and social dispensation that we find ourselves uh, with in Ireland, recipients of in Ireland, um, <clears throat> there are still people out there who feel uncomfortable about being LGBT, particularly in these formal situations. And, I, and apart from the advocacy, the very important advocacy role that the LGBT staff networks have, I, I don't think we should ever, um, and I'm not suggesting anyone is, but uh, I, I think it's good to, to uh, remember the, the social uh, role that these networks uh, play as well, that people can just simply meet each other and hang out. And they're really important. I, I remember, and I've never been, unfortunately, I've never been part of a, an LGBT staff network, but I was um, invited down to Facebook's headquarters in Dublin's Grand Canal uh, docks there. Uh, when was the last Pride Parade? <laughs> it's like ages ago, two years ago, was it? Oh, yeah. Two years ago? And so Facebook's LGBT staff network uh, had a pride breakfast that was oversubscribed. It was one of the social highlights of the year. And that year they decided not to have invest in a large and extravagant um, float and installation for the pride parade and instead pumped the money into ensuring that 500 uh, LGBT teenagers from around Ireland which was arranged by groups like Belong To, could actually come up to Dublin and participate in the Pride Parade for, for, the, uh, for the day. It was a really useful exercise. <clears throat> but um, I was really taken by coming down to Facebook and actually just um, having conversations with people who were enjoying just simply being themselves in this, in spite, you know, in, in the environment that is Facebook. And also, uh, mindful of the role they play in, I suppose, um, I hope I'm not being too optimistic here, in trying to put manners on the parents, on the parent uh, organisation. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree with that. I mean, I think that social part is is as relevant as ever. I mean, you know, just last year we had a couple of People who joined, you're right. I mean, just started working with the group, but didn't really know, you know, was it okay to come out? I mean, all the normal stuff. And when they heard there was an LGBT plus staff network, you know, there was a bit of a relief. Actually, it's okay, you know, um, you know, and you join up and you have that 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 social side. Um, I yeah, I I think that will always be the case. Um, you know, as much as then, what what is your ambition to make enduring change? You know, and uh, and uh, and to, and to move the dial because I, I think part of the challenge with with staff networks can be sort of reaching that plateau. So like you kind of start off and it's great and it's a social scene and you do the pride parades and then it's kind of well we've done three years of those. Is there anything else? You know, and it, it's it's almost keeping relevant. Uh, in terms of your 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 ambition and purpose, as much as keeping that uh, that social community, uh, I think one of the issues in an organisation is people move on, you know, and there could be a passionate leader one year, and who you know is somebody there to pick it up, and and the more you have embedded that kind of network, the more actually people do want to carry that on, and that that that's something that's really important. Yes, yes I agree. Actually. Yeah, sorry, Erin, if I may just say so. Um, I agree there. That's a very valid point that both, uh, Tony and Francis have made. And I think when you, if it, particularly if you're coming into somewhere new, uh, you're young, you're not, not maybe long out of college or whatever, uh, and you come in and you know nobody, you know very few people, and to walk into a place, you do actually think you're the only gay or the only lesbian or the only bi or trans person in the organisation. And it can be very, very daunting. And one of the ways that we, uh, we uh, have approached that 
is to have uh, one of our network or one or two of our network members has has um, a presence at induction, <coughs> which we had pushed for uh, in uh, in and promoted uh, in our LGBT employee inclusion strategy was that we were there so that people actually saw faces and saw real lesbians, gays, bi's and trans at the induction and they knew then that if they want to do when they were ready they can come to us and approach us so the culture is there there's a changing culture within the organization and it's saying yes we're here yes we're committed to lgbt inclusion and diversity and here we are and here's the people you go to and here's the people you talk to and it provides that safe space for people who are either not out out but don't really want to be involved in any huge public way uh, but or just want to be in the background kind of way it provides a very safe space for us as lgbt people that is a hugely important point actually yeah and i think what we're all getting to is kind of like this this next question that kind of has come up is these staff networks have been created and they have a great purpose we're seeing them create this inclusion in the workplace and we're seeing it let new staff members come in and know that they're safe there. And I think that is a huge role as someone you come into a new new position or a new company and you're you're wondering, do I fit here? Um, and having that social aspect is amazing. One thing that we have noticed in LGBT plus organizations and especially pride events and staff networks over the last few years is that so much the focus falls on the G. Um, and there's kind of a grappling to become more inclusive. So for your different networks that you've been a part of, how have you made sure that your staff networks have become more inclusive? Um, so I guess we'll start with, with Francis. Um, if you can talk a little bit about how your staff network has become like keyed into being more inclusive and more welcoming. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have to say, you know, you know, the, the committee we have um, has been reasonably diverse, and maybe that's just a, a function of of a large group of uh, of employees and so on. Um, but equally, you know, to your point, I think you can never um, never assume that, and you have to be aware of your potential uh, biases. Uh, you know, never assume you're not what you. Uh, you're, you're, you're fighting against and you don't have these. So I think you actively need to consider that. And it's something, you know, we we try to do that we are covering, it's not all G or L, um, and that we have activities and focus points that specifically meet, you know, with the specific challenges, for example, around the B and T communities, you know, um, you know and, and education and training around that. Um, some things we did, I mean, I, I referenced kind of what we did in terms of transgender customers and, and, and supporting their, um, you know, having that visibility. I mean, this year, for the first time, we, we raised both the pride flag and the transgender pride flag over College Green uh, in Dublin, you know, a sort of an iconic spot. Um, but it just gives that that visibility. You know, we participated in the intersex lighting up initiative um during the year lighting up uh, college green and so on and 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 did a podcast on on all staff uh, around uh, bisexuality um so i think it is around awareness first you know being being conscious of that um you know because it's a bit like i always think back to Panty's novel call, how can you not be homophobic in Ireland? You know, like we all have unconscious biases and I think we just need to constantly just challenge ourselves. Are, are you doing enough to, to the point of your, of your question? Um, I think the last point for me is the kind of the intersectional aspect, you know, it crosses I and D boundaries, you know, I mean, we're the aspect, you know, that networks are set, set up around, whether it's gender balance or, LGBT, um, you know, issues and so on. It's it, it's ultimately it's it's never the, the the single aspect that defines you. And I, I think reaching out across uh, different networks just gives you that wider perspective and kind of educates you and continues to do that. Francis, I'd agree with you there about the need for for wider communication. I mean, that sort of like ensures that people are feel emboldened 
uh, and that more secure about in the rightness of what they're doing and also can actually learn from each other. Various networks can learn from each other, particularly if they're at different stages of development. I think that's really important. It strikes me too that um, there's, a, there's an enormous value to the exercise that we're engaged in at the moment, you know, um, sponsored by Dublin Pride, because there is, there, there is no, I'm not aware in Ireland anyway, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's is there some template? Is there an actual a, a up a staff network and sort of make it happen? How to sort of give expression to um, the the concerns and needs of a minority grouping in any sort of employment uh, situation? They don't exist uh, um, uh, that I'm aware of. So um, it is having having these these um, wider um, discourses whether they're virtual or in person, I think are, are hugely valuable. Um, and they also too, I think, uh, I, I'd like to imagine that the, um, in the future, they also act as an incentive to other uh, groups and organizations that have yet to actually um, in, um, uh, instigate a, 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 a network of the type that we take for granted in many of these larger organizations. Yeah, yeah I think I, there's I, that. I that competitive sort of thing you know tony i'd absolutely agree and it's it's almost like carrot and stick in a way you know a carrot is like it's just a good thing to do but there is a bit of god they're doing it what, what are we doing and you know and stakeholders ask the same questions and I, I think you're right you build up that momentum i mean certainly you know uh, i'm part of an insurance ireland uh, inclusion diversity task force and you do get companies going i want to start i want to do this but where do you go to your template? And like other organizations go, well, we've done some of it so you can learn, are you professional networks and, and so on. So it's, it just builds on that. And ultimately the odd one out is, is the organization who doesn't have this rather than the other way around, you know? And I think that's, that, that, that's how you grow this. And um, I think also, um, and Tony hit on it there earlier as well, is communication is key, actually. You need to keep yourself, first of all, I think any, if you want to reach out to LGBT people and particularly those who are not G or not L, because we have quite a number in Dublin City Council of bisexual colleagues uh, who are not out at all and are not comfortable coming out. We have less uh, out, we have a number of trans colleagues too, obviously, two who are openly trans. Um, but in order for uh, any LGBT person, and particularly the B and the T, to feel safe, I think it has to be LGBT led and there has to be constant reaching out and constant communication. And what we do in Dublin City Council uh, ourselves is we, at strategic times during the year, we'll have something up on our intranet uh, promoting something LGBT. We'll, we'll mark... Um, Trans Recognition Day now at the end of March. We'll mark, mark Trans uh, Remember Day of Remembrance in November, and we'll have regular postings in Dublinet, uh, what we call a Dublinet, that's us, our intranet, and in our uh, newsletter. Uh, and that's how we reach out, and that's how people have become involved. And we have one very good role model, uh, trans role model, Amy, particularly, is great, and she has done that because of our communications uh, to the wider corporate body and because of our presence at induction. And I've done that. And I think that was very much highlighted at our Out at Work conference uh, last year, in um, when we, which we co-hosted with South Dublin. It has to be LGBT-led uh, for it to make any sense. It's the people with the lived experience will give you guidance, and that's where we'll feel safe. Um, so you just have to keep battering away and keep communicating, keep chipping away, keep chatting, keep talking, keep, keep reaching out. Mistakes happen. If you make a mistake, make it, move on, get over it. That's what has to happen. And people will, once they start feeling safe and once they start feeling that support, which has to come from the top down, as we've already said, or has to come from, uh, the support has to come from the top. It has to be led by us with the support from the top, us treated as equals. More and more people will come out and will feel safe to do so. Uh, and once we're not afraid to uh, embrace our difference and have our difference utilized in a positive way to the betterment of your organizations or whatever companies you're in, it will, it will be hugely beneficial to everybody. I mean, if you feel happy and safe in work, you're going to perform better. That's the reality, you know. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and I think kind of some of the things that all of you were hitting on was a lot of this work up until now that the LGBTQ plus staff networks have done is really approach things from a, a perspective of a culture of calling other people in. Um, that's, you know, calling the higher ups, calling the rest of your staff to buy in, calling people together. And to kind of move a little bit forward, I want to throw this to Tony. Um, Tony, I know you're a historian and not a future Aryan, um, and you can't make predictions, but how do you kind of see LGBTQ staff networks evolving in the future? If we were to have this conversation maybe in 10 or 20 years, what do you think some of the new things LGBTQ plus staff networks will be doing um, to continue to grow and adapt to the change of the world around us? Oh no, have we lost Tony's volume? Okay. Um, yeah, Francis or Martina, what, do you, what about you? Um, do either of you want to kind of jump in really quick on kind of the future of staff networks? We'll start with Francis, I guess. Yeah, I'm uh, absolutely interested in, in, in Tony's uh, uh, projection for the future here. Um, I, I think it is interesting. I think we do need to keep adapting. Um, I think there's two things come to mind for me. I think one is is actually protecting the gains we've made, you know, and I think it's sort of fighting complacency. I kind of always conscious of that, you know, um, you can see how things can get rolled back or, you know, targeted. So it's really important we, we avoid that. And I think back to that sort of purpose and ambition, you know, you do have that ambition to, uh, to, to change things. Um, I think the real test is kind of constantly moving it from words to actions in a sense and, and calling out what you what what you want to get done uh, and so on. Um, I think things will evolve. I think it is about kind of using that power that corporates can have when they decide they want to do something positive and you know whether it's for their own workforce, or the industry they're in, or much wider in society, and I can I think just connecting staff networks with other networks um, and rallying around a specific cause. I, I I think there's power in in numbers around that. So uh, I think it's just uh, protecting what we have and and kind of evolving and rallying around uh, you know the next challenge uh, because our work is kind of never never done in a sense. Yeah, I think that's really great perspective, especially the protecting the gains we've already made. I think one thing that we really note in any marginalized community is the more there is visibility, the more there becomes challenge, um, especially as someone within the trans community. I know as our community became, uh, continues to become more visible, there are continual challenges to who trans people are and what our place is in society. So as a wider community, we have to kind of protect the gains that we have as we go forward. Um, I know Tony is back now, so we'll throw it back to Tony um, if you wanna go hop back in on the question. Yeah, I suppose a simple answer to your question, Aaron, is um, look at predicting the future is um, I, I see intersectionality. Um, Internet intersectionality informing um, dialogue, informing um, uh, the processes that LGBT staff engage in. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, we when you look at LGBT staff, they're a prime example of our rainbow society resourcing our survival, resourcing our future, resourcing ourselves, educating ourselves, and in doing so, also bringing I would like to. I would like to imagine bringing wider mainstream Irish society or societies with us uh, in our wake, uh, and I'm sure um, Martina could actually give us some beautiful examples of that that she's seen in in, in, in Dublin City Council. So I actually think we need to have LGBT staff networks need to use their collective. Um, sense of purpose and duty and their collective uh, sense of compassion and empathy uh, going forward to look at unresolved issues to to for example embrace the concerns of of of, of migrant workers to embrace the concerns of of lgbt travelers and um, 
um, to essentially um, um, approach the unfinished business we have in what I'd like to imagine is um, building a model republic in the cusp of, of, of celebrating um, the centenary of the Irish stage. And there's still, we still have to give some effect to the, the um, founding principles um, that were laid out in 1916. We still have to build um, our socialist republic. And I'd like to imagine that LGBT staff networks um, will aim to be at the centre of, of those discussions so that it's not just about our, um, of course it's about our immediate concerns, but we are, are compassionate and big enough to uh, as, as a society, as a, a rainbow society, an LGBT community, and see the, the wider picture and make, make those connections, those necessary connections. I think that's really important. And the other thing too is, we also have a duty of care to our brothers and sisters living abroad who are living, you know, so in terms of finessing the, the communication channels finessing and finessing the conversations that um, say the likes of Francis's group are, are, are um, um, I've just done a blank. Martina. Who am I talking Martina. to? Martina. 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 Sorry, Martina. But, but in terms of finessing the lines of communication that, for example, uh, groups like um, Martina and, and Francis have, um, dialogue with our brothers and sisters abroad, I think is hugely important as well, especially when you see what's going on in other parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I'm not being too optimistic. I'm being too ambitious here. <laughs> oh, I think we need to be ambitious, and I think we no, should I'm encourage that. Ambition. Yeah, I, I, if, if I may come in there, because I, I know that I, I touched on it earlier there when I was talking, um, it, just in relation to our own network and where we want to go, in terms of uh, if, if our organisations are committed to uh, diversity and inclusion, not just LGBT diversity and inclusion, then um, I, I just just give you an example. At some stage there last autumn, one of our elected councillors sent in a council question and one of us, the question was to the effect, would Dublin City Council support uh, the, the idea of uh, a BAME network, you know, a black and minority ethnic network, staff network? And the answer, that a senior manager then replies, this is what happens, they send in their, their council questions to whatever department is, 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 is the question is for. Uh, this one came to HR and a senior manager replies saying, yes, that we were very open uh, to the idea and uh, of having you know, various staff networks around the place and that uh, the LGBT network, Dublin City Council's LGBT network uh, was a lead example on staff led networks. Now that to me, I'm hugely honoured that we should be get, uh, that we should be held up there for the rest of the organisation and as an example to an elected councillor of how to get some things right. But the lack of inclusivity was that we didn't know that. The only reason I know that that was said is because some of us have, have an interest in, in council meetings. So for us to have a real impact, uh, and as Francis says, to hold on to the gains that we've made and to fight really strongly for them, uh, and to network in and to support uh, our LGBT colleagues in, in, in mainland Europe, particularly because we're in, within the EU, uh, it is huge. I, I completely agree with what you're saying, Tony, but to do that, we have to lead on it. We have to provide, we have to keep talking, keep chipping away for our inclusion, our diversity uh, to be uh, respected and cherished. Uh, and, and we therefore have to lead on any diversity and inclusion training throughout the organisation. We have to be the ones that leads on any LGBT policies uh, and we have to prove the ones that are there. And if we say they're not OK, then they're not OK. Uh, and that's the way it is, and that's the way it should be. And to fight for that and to sell that in a way that's non-threatening isn't always easy, I can tell you, because uh, we in Dublin City Council, sometimes these things don't happen that easily. We can send out a message to the wider corporate body saying that says very clearly we're cis, heterosexual and predominantly male. And at the same time, we're sort of talking to people here and having private arrangements with some with some people that isn't necessarily LG, we're not necessarily nailing our uh, LGBT commitment or our com we're not nailing our commitment to LG LGBT diversity to the mast. So we still need to be there. We still need to drive for it. We're not there yet. I mean, we are making huge progress, uh, 
uh, and I admire all my colleagues who, who are involved in that, not just LGBT colleagues, but uh, the colleagues in, in HO, even if I sometimes growl and give out about them, um, including our colleagues in the Equality Office. We have we have good people there, sincere people. Uh, and uh, so I'm like, I'm optimistic and hopeful, but uh, I don't think it's going to just happen unless we keep driving it and unless we're allowed to be the lead on it and it has to happen and tony is right we have to be at the center and the lead of these conversations with other networks awesome so i guess as we get closer to the end where there's the one the one topic we have not talked about um and this might give some people some practical steps but how have your staff networks navigated covid um how have you kind of kept those your group kind of like working together, supported, um, and what are what are some ways that you're looking forward to bettering that connection, or what are some ways that like you can connect remotely right now as a staff network? Yeah, I, I mean some some practical examples. Um, you know, I've seen and we we put in place. I think you're right. After the initial period world being upended and plans discarded and so on uh, you know we kind of regrouped and, and, and just to see what we could do in, in a virtual way because you know a lot of our community within the bank and so on were the same as many others isolated maybe living alone or whatever issues personal issues that people were dealing with um so we we I suppose in a positive way, we, I suppose, engaged in a broader range of activities, you know, um, and it had a wider reach. I think there were colleagues within, you know, the organization we wouldn't normally have reached, you know, because maybe where they lived. So we did a lot of drop in virtual coffee mornings, podcasts, webinars, bingo with Bunny, um, for, you know, belong to, hosted that with us. And I think it just allowed, uh, you know, a, a wide range of from serious to, to fun. Um, uh, I think also was critical that, you know, we were so conscious of the organizations we deal with, you know, it, did, it didn't just drop away because pride wasn't happening uh, in a physical form. You know, I think it was clear, actually, the need on the ground was greater than, than ever. And, you know, having connections with community organizations, I think, helped continue that. Um, you know, and I, I do have a hope, even though it's, it, it seems gloomy right now, uh, winter and COVID and everything, you know, that we will come out of this maybe closer together, you know, things that matter, you know, and the gains in communication, I think, will help, you know, get reach across to uh, people we, we wouldn't normally have thought about because actually it's just a click away. Um, so that's maybe just a kind of a sense. Great, thanks. Yeah. Martina, or Tony, um, do you I, want to hop in? Yeah, for, for ourselves, we've, we've, we've used any of the outlets, the social media outlets, our WhatsApps. Initially, during lockdown, we were Zooming a lot. Now we have our Teams meeting, our Microsoft Teams meetings, and we do that fairly regularly. Um, uh, we and we have been we have got calls then from the wider network that's the network committee itself from our wider network we've had calls because they're involved with other lgbt organizations outside of outside of work and obviously they've had to disband or they can't meet up in person or whatever which has had has its own negative knock-on effect uh, on people so they have contacted us to ask what they might be able to do or whatever and we've been able to guide them and steer them there it, we do keep in touch and now it's not always easy given the nature of uh, the organization because we're working remotely from home and we have busy day jobs and finding the time and the space to commit to other stuff when we're working remotely isn't easy and i have found it Quite challenging myself because I must say I miss my I miss my LGBT family. I mean I have a happy home life. It's great. Uh, everybody and it's great, and I totally cherish it. However, part of part of the joy for me going into work is that I have LGBT colleagues that I meet regularly, um, and so I miss I miss that real rather than the virtual interaction. I miss it quite a bit. So we just keep in touch with one another as best we can and, we, and encourage one another best as best we can. And we keep one another in touch with the other supports outside of here, like the belong to's and the, and the whoever it is, the other organizations that are tirelessly working on our behalf in very difficult circumstances, it has to be said. Absolutely. Yeah. Tony, was there oh, anything Tony. you wanted to throw in on that one as well? No, no, no. This has been a really interesting and valuable conversation. 
uh, and I hope it sort of it cheese up uh, some someone who's listening who's like feels inspired to go off and co-opt some of the ideas we're talking about and establish their own LGBT staff network in whatever size uh, group and setting uh, they find themselves in. Yeah, absolutely. It's also yeah, part of that. being. You know, at the end of the day, we're all part of a wider conversation. That's really important in mm. terms of helping ourselves and also being in, an inspiration to other groups. And it's really interesting, too, if you think about the, 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 the whole um, anti, anti-discrimination and equality um, agenda, if you want to call it that, has been driven by minority groups. You know, it hasn't trickled down from, from the mainstream. It's... it's has been or people representative of us, not just LGBT, but but members of other minority groups who have who have who demanded change in uh, employment environments. So it's really, really, really important that we continue to nourish uh, and support these networks. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'll just kind of start wrapping it up, but. I hope I'm, I'm speaking for all of us by saying for anyone watching, if you have questions about how to build a staff network or how to better your staff network, all of us are available to help um, from Tenny doing training to Francis and Martina talking about that lived experience. So do reach out. Um, and I hope that as you've been a part of this conversation for the last hour, you might have learned some new points, maybe got a, a little bit of the overview of the history and a look to the future. And I hope you're encouraged as much as we're working remotely right now that there are staff networks that are working for our inclusion and working for the betterment of our community. Um, and thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share this. So many great points have come about. I'll throw it back to Jamie and Dublin Pride for the next module that's coming up. And thank you so much for your time today. Thanks very much, Erin, uh, excellently chaired. Um, and thank you, of course, to Martina, Tony, and Francis as well. And of course, our wonderful ISL interpreters, which you can see down in your corner. Folks, we're gonna take a quick break now for about 30 minutes before the next session starts. But while we do so, get yourself a tea or a coffee and check out our expo function, um, where you can see a lot of our community organizations, or of course, the networking feature, which should be to your left. Okay, see you in half an hour.